Kia ora and welcome to Otago University's Vote 2023. We're running pre-election interviews with politicians filmed right here at the university's media production studio. These interviews will be available on Newsroom, Facebook, YouTube and other social media as the general election approaches on Saturday the 14th of October. Vote 2023 is made by students for students and hopes to entertain and inform viewers about their potential representatives this election. Vote 2023 aims to raise a profile of a number of election issues as public discussions continue to be the central means by which we can test political issues in this country. Well, our guest this morning needs no introduction. The Right Honourable Winston Peters is the founder and leader of New Zealand First, the former Deputy Prime Minister and the former Foreign Minister. Well, welcome, Winston. Thank you very much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me on. So, obviously, you're no stranger to election cycles. You're a veteran of this. How are you feeling about this coming election and how are you finding the campaign? Well, the campaign for New Zealand First is going marvellously well. It's been long planned, long targeted. We've been under the radar going out to the, the meetings all around the country and packing the halls. We've had no mainstream media coverage, which we weren't surprised about and not surprised about it now but it's working for us brilliantly and the timing is perfect. But the tragedy in this campaign, of course, is that the country is in a financial mess and so many promises are being made out there that cannot be fulfilled because they're not being realistic as to what's gone wrong with the economy and what needs to fix it up. And so I just hope that people can see through the uh, haze and plethora of promises and understand that we're in a far more serious situation. It is not just a minor recession, it's gonna deepen um, we've massively overspent and all those things is, are possible if it was spent on production and wealth creation but a lot of it's been on consumption and if they had a plan these other parties to get us into being the wealthy country we once were then we could uh, handle all this and give particularly young people hope and ensure that they stayed here and not went off to some other country for their future. Mm -hmm. So you've been the leader of New Zealand First for 30 years and before that you had experience as an MP for the National Party. What do you know now about politics and about running a country that you maybe didn't know when you first started out as a politician? A whole lot of things <laughs> I can tell you now. I don't want to knock anybody but I'm, I'm surprised. You know, it's a famous saying by Bernard Shaw. I think he said, he knows nothing, he thinks he knows everything, but surely points to a career in politics. <laughs> and how many young people do I know that look like that? And I was one of them once. But I was told back then, look, uh, breathe through your nose. Try and keep your, you've got, uh, you were given two ears and one mouth, use them in that proportion, and you might learn something. And I'm lucky to have had that sort of guidance when I was a young person, from people like Holly Oak and Muldoon and others. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think Charlotte's going to go into talking about some constitutional issues which we'd like to discuss. Yeah, absolutely. You? So, your party, New Zealand First, has proposed a referendum extending the parliamentary term from three years to four. Do you believe that this would lead to more effective politics, and if so, why? Uh, we believe it would lead to far more effective uh, national poli central politics or uh, national and uh, central government uh, decision-making by politicians, but also at the local government level, because far too much time is, you've hardly won the election, you're out campaigning for the next one. And it's expensive. Not just in terms of the cost to the, the taxpayer, and, but to political parties and their supporters, but it's expensive in terms of diverted time in which you, you, when you should be diverted to solutions and long-range plans. But I've also said this, that why can't these political parties who all say they're going to win, put their money where their mouth is and agree right now, uh, and they could do it today. They could have a bill and being passed all this afternoon, the last day of Parliament. And I said it some time ago, why don't you guys put your money where your mouth is, but put a caveat on the legislation. So you all agree, get it through Parliament, but make it a referendum in the 2023 election. Let the people decide. And if the people decide, we'll have four years of Parliament. But no one's going to make this decision unless political parties themselves can actually agree on something that might be a good idea, which might be the problem, eh? Yeah. <laughs> Hard to get them to agree <laughs> these days, eh? Hey? Yes. Um, and so, moving on from that, do you believe that the 5% party percentage threshold should be lowered? Right now, you yourself are sitting at 4% in the polls. No, I'm not. We're, done. We're way higher than that. Are you? Well, that's fantastic. We are. It's you good to hear. <laughs> well, the Talbot Mills has always got us at 6%. It's out there now. Talbot Mills is a respectable pollster. Some has got us on 7 Some has got us far past that. Oh, mm -hmm. And I'm okay. grateful to say that to you now because yeah. I'm sick and tired of the mainstream media trying to denigrate from a past record 
mm. what our rising tide is. They know we're coming back big time. Mm. I know it's horrifying for them, because they might be held to account for the first time for a long time. But we're way past that. Oh, that's great. I clearly now, just haven't looked at the polls. When you talk about the 5% threshold, yep. yes, my party is against... Not, we're the only new political party uh, that is still for the 5% threshold. Yep. Not 3% and chaos and 3.5% or 4%. We are for 5%, because even though we've been the victim of the 5% threshold, you, instead of blaming everybody else, you'll have a hard look in the mirror, or at circumstances. Or like last time, the COVID election was such a hopeless election for everybody. Uh, and stop blaming everybody else. Blame yourselves and then get ready for your next um, potential comeback or next engagement. But we do not want to see the instability of chaos that is in Israel, mm -hmm. or there I say it still, in Italy, where I think they've had uh, 70 governments in 67 years. Different governments in 67 years. And so New Zealand First is the only new political party that argues for 5%, because we argue for that level being stability. Yeah, accountability yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. fantastic. Uh, with accountability, there's, off, there's been a lot of talk with young people around our age about lowering the voting age to 16 instead of 18. Do you support lowering the voting age or do you think there should be a referendum that we should hold in New Zealand on this issue? Well, if you had a referendum, the answer would be no for a start because all the people who think different to you, the 16 to 18 year olds, and let me tell you, a whole lot of people who are 18 to 21 will not be voting for it either. But I'll give you the reason why one has to be concerned about such a suggestion. As a lawyer in, at a court, when a young person is run of the court, the first plea is this person is not old enough and their mind is not mature enough to be totally guilty for what they've done. That's the universal 100% argument in every youth defence at court. And then all of a sudden you say, oh yes they are, here we go, they can vote. Well you can't have it both ways. And more importantly, I think back to when I was 16, I wasn't um, equipped or new enough to vote. Uh, I don't know whether I was equipped to do that when I was 18 either. But that's not the point. It's 80 now, and we don't want it to go any lower. For the very reason that the, uh, all of the arguments and theory and belief taught at this university as well is that a person's mind is not mature at 16 years of age. Well, if a 16-year-old can work and pay tax mm. that go towards funding the country's public policy, mm. you could argue that they should have a say about what that public policy will look like. Well, that sounds brilliant until you realise the inconsistency of how many 16-year-olds are not working and paying tax, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It's a double-edged sword. Well, you've got to hear both sides of the story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. double-edged sword, that one, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's not use uh, some military terms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about democracy and freedom here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I'll just have one more question for you before we yeah. move on to yeah. Jonah discussing foreign policy with you. Uh, my last question for you is, do you believe that New Zealand should become a republic? It's fascinating you should say that because all the other political leaders will say yes, but not now. Mm -hmm. My point is we are uh, ca we're capable of having many constitutional engagements. We belong to a commonwealth now of, uh, that's now comprised of 56 countries with about seven other countries applying for it. That's a you know, commonwealth we belong to at this point in time. And that's more, way more than half of the majority in the United Nations. So my belief as a foreign minister is we should always try and keep our friends with us. And the other thing that is New Zealand's first unique aspiration is to have a um, free trade agreement with the Commonwealth itself. It, because it comprises 23, uh, 2.3 billion people. It has got um, an eco economic performance level of 5.5%. This is way better than our lousy 0.8%, which is less than 1%. But on the question of the uh, Republic, um, uh, my uh, challenge to others who want to get rid of the monarchy is, you tell me what the price of that's going to be. You're going to tell me what the price of the president will be, and please don't tell me you're going to have former politicians being the president. Because I've been utterly opposed with that, with exceptions to politicians being ambassadors and high commissioners, unless they're absolutely exceptional exceptions, rather than this our turn now, and let's go over and fill the London Post, and let's fill the Irish Post, and let's fill, for example, Washington. I've seen the old parties misusing diplomatic affairs that way, and when it comes to this country, I'm for staying as we are now because it doesn't cost us a cent to have a queen or a king. Um, and the idea, you know, that somehow we'll improve by getting rid of that. Well, have we got a better legal system for getting rid of the Privy Council, one of the finest jurisdictions in the world? 
Do you think our Supreme Court is as good as the Privy Council in London? That has got a brilliant record of performance? My answer is no. I thought so then, I still think so. Having had the wine box go there once. Do you remember that? Well, read about it. <laughs> Don't remember it. <laughs> well, uh, speaking of kings and queens, yeah. you've uh, gained the nickname the Kingmaker due to the role that you've played in forming coalition governments in the past. Uh, I could give you my private thoughts, but you don't want to hear them on this, uh, that description because <laughs> I hate it. Uh, no, but I hate it because what I was seeing in New Zealand is the mainstream media's absolute um, failure to actually, over 30 years, describe what MMP is about. I do not see that in the Nordic countries. I do not see that in Germany. I don't see it elsewhere. But the New Zealand mainstream media just myopically are for the first past the post. And their description of things is entirely wrong. And then they find a cheap caption, the king maker or the queen maker, whatever, everything else. But we're still in that every day now. Instead of actually reporting what politicians are saying or what I'm saying, they're out there trying to tell me what I should be doing, who I should be going with, and who should be ruling Winston Peters and New Zealand first out. Do you get the image here? Yeah. This is dirt. And frankly, uh, the people of this country, and young people in particular, deserve far better in democracy than they're theorizing. Why don't we just let the public the voter, who's the master here, he or him decide the selection, rather than cheap, junky, bribed, corrupt, mainstream media journalists. Mm. You got that clear? Got it clear. Right. Well, go on. Have a democracy for it. <laughs> I, I'd just like to ask, if you were to find yourself in the position, where you'd, well, we, which you likely will, in the position of having to decide who to go with in terms of forming a coalition or supply and confidence deal, is there any particular policy that you would uh, hold as something that's non-negotiable for you, something that's particularly important in terms of New Zealand First priorities this election? Yeah, well, I'm sorry to double down on my last comment, but it's the last 30 years, and your question, I'm not blaming you, but it images it. You said to me, you, I am a leader of a caucus. I belong to a democratic party more than any other party in this country. In the Francis report into parliamentary behaviour, only one political party survived it, New Zealand First. I'm proud of that. And so it's not me. It's my whole caucus makes this decision and my board. But over and over again, it's down to you. And if one man, he runs the whole show like some sort of dictator. It is utterly false, untrue. Uh, and uh, to, for me to even try to answer that question is to say, without any reference to my caucus colleagues, that's what you're going to do. And that's not the way we run things. So I can't answer that question. It's over to the organisation, backed up by the board of New Zealand First. Fair enough. Yeah. Well, if we rephrase that question for you then, as your party as a whole, something that you guys have sat down, your caucus has sat down and deliberated together, what do you think a value that your party holds as a whole, the whole caucus, what do you think one thing for them is particularly important? Well, the value we hold is that uh, since 1893 in the formation of the Liberal Party and then the Labour Party in 1916 and then until the National Party in 1936, so to speak, the new party that has lasted longest and performed the best and had the most in say in politics in New Zealand is a party called New Zealand First. Now you won't see that from these other people, but the Alliance, the Alliance has been around 51 years. 51 years and never had a minister inside a cabinet. That's over half a century. The ACT Party's been around almost 30 years. And that's almost a third of a century and has never had a minister inside a cabinet. We've been different. We've made governments and formed governments and we've taken a lot of criticism from all manner of people. But the reality of it is a political party like New Zealand First has its destiny in the name of our party. We want New Zealand to be the number one country in the world as we in former times were and could be again because we've got the resources, we've got the people, we've got the wrong leadership. Well, uh, I'd just like to pivot to talking about foreign policy for a bit given your expertise in this area. Um, as your previous two stints as foreign minister. Is foreign policy a priority for New Zealand First this election? It always is and has been a priority for New Zealand in First in, this, in every election and in our whole thinking and the whole manifesto and uh, the formation of the party itself. Uh, they say there are no votes in foreign policy and that's a sad thing uh, because um, New Zealand used to be, and I think this is still the case, we used to read more international magazines than any other population on earth, which means we're not introverted. We're an extrovert people looking abroad, looking for change. And uh, the problem has been that the two old parties have sold down the drain, uh, foreign policy in particular. Uh, someone uh, died um, 
all those years ago, it was the last person before Winston Peters came along that really injected some support into foreign policy and foreign aid. His name was Norm Norman Kirk, and this is an anniversary for his death. But he came to claim Prime Minister in 1972 uh, uh, and died in 1974. Uh, so the real point is that uh, there's a time when you have to look at this country and say, what do we need to do abroad? And to get this country to be the export powerhouse it should be, we need a far greater foreign affair pr affairs present, presence. Ireland has two and a half times more diplomats offshore. So does Singapore. Maybe they know something about exporting and trade that we should be practicing rather than this eternal idiotic statement that New Zealand is punching above its weight. No, we're not. We're not punching nearly amongst our weight. We're not, our, our exports in decline compared to what they should be. So yes, foreign affairs is critically important and I wish more universities and more uh, academic commentators and journalists would get it through their heads that we are an export dependent nation. More than most countries I know, and unless we get our exports and wealth creation and added value up the top of the line, then we're just kind of sliding, sliding down the level of performance, which we are. We used to be in the top two or three in the world. We're now probably in the 33, 34. We've got the resources, we've got the people, we haven't got the right plans or leadership. Would you like to see a diversification in our export markets? Do you think that would build Absolutely, resilience? absolutely. I mean, examine whether you're Labour or National, because they're both responsible for this. You've got one product, and it's the lowest value called milk powder, one company called Fonterra, and one market called China. How stupid is that? Have we got the infant formula business in the world that's 54 billion, where we'd be selling at the top of the line because we're the best dairy industry in the world? No. They've got that as well. And so we've made some massive mistakes in diversification and as fast as possible is our only hope now because China is in a serious recession and it'll only get worse. Well, China is certainly facing its own um, domestic economic problems. I'd like to ask about China's role on the international stage, especially in the Pacific and the, in the wider Indo-Pacific region. So uh, in 2018, you launched the Pacific Reset as foreign minister, which was widely acclaimed as a successful re-engagement with our Pacific Island partners. How do you view the current state of the Pacific in terms of international relations? Do you think that it's becoming... Is the MFET report that came out this year characterized it as no longer strategically benign, referring, of course, to superpower contests in the region. How do you view the current state of the Pacific? Well, do you remember who it was that said it, that it was strategically benign? Alan Clark. That's right. How wrong that was. I mean, I couldn't believe it back then, and now we've got people saying it now. At the same time, of course, they've dropped the ball. Not the department, but the Minister of Foreign Affairs has utterly dropped the ball. I mean, Pansy Wong got in in Australia, and she's on the plane immediately trying to reconnect with Fiji and Solomon Islands. What was our minister doing? Nothing. And what was the commentary and the journalists and everybody else saying? Well, nothing, actually, as well. This is the sad thing about it. I would hope the universities would actually notice what was going on not, or not going on. But when I got the job in 2017, uh, our foreign aid was falling to 0.21 of GDP, the lowest in the whole OECD, in a blue continent in which we are fundamental big players. So we had to do something dramatic, and we turned it around to 0.35, just like that. Now, it's, we had a massive struggle trying to get it through the Labour Party's heads that this was important. But we are not an island, we are not a nation, but we're not isolated in that context. We've got to play a far bigger role in terms of our own security. And the so-called benign strategic environment never existed. And China has changed, unless these people haven't uh, noticed. Can I just say also my experience in politics and, or politicians and others dealing with China is that their lack of understanding of who they're talking to or their lack of respect of how bright these people are or how long range their thinking is. And I sit there and wonder to myself, do you actually think you know who you're talking to there? Because I don't think you do. In my case, as I say, I try to keep my ears open, my mouth shut, trying to learn who I'm dealing, dealing with, because it so happens that 5,000 years ago, our DNA came from there. Do you know that? The Māori people, <laughs> yeah. Well, when I said it in 996, they all jeered at me. But they're not saying it now, are they? Yeah. Well, so uh, should we be concerned about China? Is what I'm trying to get we at. We should be concerned about the changed China. Okay. China has changed, and the, the figures point to that. 
uh, but also what's the, has the difficulty is that a lot of people don't know how to talk to the Chinese. And by that I mean, if you say to someone, you've told me that you're a peaceful nation, I trust you. What does that mean? Well, you've got to argue, I'm a peaceful nation and I'll start acting peacefully. But there's a psychological approach in how you talk to people. Women know it better than men, of course. <laughs> and that's why we've got to travel. Just one last question on foreign policy. Yes. So we've seen the AUKUS Pact formed, and that's been interpreted as a, as a response to increased Chinese assertion in the Indo-Pacific. What's your view on AUKUS, and do you think New Zealand should play a role in AUKUS? Well, if you're going to have technology, military technology, then make sure it's the best and the latest. And what they had there before wasn't the best and the latest, so AUKUS makes sense. Uh, the reality is that our problem as a country is that if we think we can sit aside here with a um, statement of neutrality, we're kidding ourselves. We need to make it very certain that China understands us and what our values and what our belief and are prepared to defend freedom looks like. It's in Chairman Mao's thoughts. He said, push forward. If you strike mush, push forward further. If you strike steel, pull back. And our job, not to be a, a, a violent or ferocious or war-mongering nation, but it's nevertheless to defend democracy and freedom in the Pacific and in our neighbourhood and be part of it, play our role. We won't get anywhere if we look like we're bludgers. So perhaps a stronger stance defending liberty. Well, the and and funny enough, I was quite astonished to see Andrew Little making some positive comments about that, that we've got to spend more on our military. And I know that the Greens and a whole lot of left-wingers will be opposed to that because they don't understand the world in that context. And every time there's a crisis, they expect the military to be there, whether it's in the islands or in our own country. But somehow, the rest of the time, they can't do anything and can't be giving any provisioning. No, every democracy, and you'll see it in Scandinavia and elsewhere, has got to defend itself. or be prepared to make this defence. And hopefully, that willingness to defend itself will deter people from beginning wars because no one could be more anti-war than anybody that's been any way knowledgeable about it. It's an awful outcome. Great. Well, thank you for that. I was just going to move on to a topic that is a bit of a hot button issue with you sometimes, the culture wars issue. Winston, I just have to ask, do you believe, I see you looking around, I know, <laughs> it had to be brought up, I believe. I can't believe I heard that. I know. But do you believe that you are fueling a culture war? People say that you are. Do you agree with that sentiment or no? No, I, did, I am opposed to uh, fascist, Marxist, racist, who think they're going to turn this issue of race into an elite where a certain group, unelected, not having any tin or runga tira tunga, making claims that are absolutely false, uh, making them claims that they are chiefs and that they are leaders when they're not, never having asked their own people, the Maori people, for this, making all these demands in their name while never giving a thing to ordinary Maori. I've lived through as a young lawyer all my young life and my career seeing this emerge and uh, as someone who's done as much as I could for the Maori world in some of the biggest land cases ever when I started my career to defend Maori and European in a great case back then and win, uh, I'm looking at this modern elite group who say, um, give it to me and I'll deliver it to my people. Let me tell you, you might not remember, but the American Civil Rights Movement was a movement where they never took their eye off the prize to bust into access to the best white institutions, universities, hospitals, employment, everything. And they ended up with a black American president. That's progress. Black American bright president right now, that's progress. Here, we've got these people, the very people trying to image me that way, who want to set up separate institutions, all of which are a miserable failure. Te Whata Ora is about what? Delivering medicine to Maori? No, they've some of them waiting eight years for an operation, whilst they have all these Maori words above uh, the establishment we're talking about. Or they have a waka on the road, waka kotahi, well, there's potholes everywhere in Hokianga and the East Coast, and they've got this waka on the road or we get on a New Zealand flight out of Dunedin and all of a sudden you find about Tiake making his connection with his ancestry and you're in a waka in the sky. That after the plane has left three quarters of an hour late. We are sick of this sham delivery for Māori and we want the real thing. Safe, affordable housing, medicine, health delivery instantly for everybody. 
because it's available and then when they need it. The access to climb onto the escalators of education goes as far as you like, like some of us did, and first world wages. That's what we stand for. And come to think of it, not just Māori want that, everybody wants it. And that's why we are a party of unity when the rest of a party of separatism and racism. Do you think that those goals you talk about are necessarily in opposition to increased use of te reo in official um, government departments and so forth? Why, why do you set I, them up in that I sense? Was where, I was there when te reo got to start in the first place. Why don't you ask um, Edatani Faifetirangi, which is the guy that's been backing Māori language from a young time as a politician? She said Winston Peters is not um, anti-Māori, he's anti-nonsense. She's right. This woman's in, almost in her 90s now. But I'm better to go with her testimony to get the truth, uh, opposed to the Willie Jacksons and others trying to image me somewhere else in some other way. And I'm not against the real. The real is to menace, like it, as all languages are, to intellect for the intellectual expansion of the brain and the flexibility of the brain. Of course it is. But let me say this to you. All communication is about understanding. And if I'm trying to get to the hospital because I'm sick and I've been in a crisis or had an accident, I'm not interested in trying to read about the, the, the Maori language. Now, I want to get to a hospital. If you don't mind, that's, got, that's the reason why I'm, I'm taking my, um, advantage of the facility. But that's not what's going on now. You're getting there. And uh, the communications understanding argument has been totally lost. 95% of the people don't know what they're saying. I just have to ask Winston there. So part of your election commitments that you've outlined on the New Zealand First website includes making English one of the official languages of our country because we speak it every day, it's what we're taught, and it is our de facto language. So by making English one of our official languages, what changes? What, what are you hoping to achieve by creating it? Because it is our de facto language. First of all, de facto is not English, OK? okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's number one. The second thing is, and I've seen these people come out, and not you, but they image their ignorance because there's a thing out there called the Plain Language Act, which it says an all statute should be in language that ordinary New Zealanders can understand, excepting Māori can be in there and 95% can't understand it. See that? So you can have an act on explain in plain language to people who speak English what is intended to be done, but the moment you interpose the Māori words there, that changes the whole thing because there's no longer plain language to 95% of the people. They can't even understand the statute they're reading now. And when you see that absolute disaster coming on, of idiocy happening, where, as I say, communications is about understanding, and there can't be an understanding because they don't connect, then it's the time to fix the law up and make English an official language. And that's my response to all these flim-flam experts who came out with me, because they don't understand the plain language legislation in this country. They're just educationally uninformed. Are you against having Te Reo Māori as one of our official languages as a part of this oh, claim that you're making? How could I be? I was then we made an official language. You were? Let's mm. what, 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 Don't you realise that? Oh, I wasn't <laughs> around, I have to say, I have to admit. Well, that's quite possible. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but what will happen to Te Reo Māori with this uh, claim that you're making? You're saying that this issue, that making English an official language, will deal with the issue of racism. And so what do you think that, where does Te Reo Māori stand in this proposal? What will happen to it? Look, I was there at the beginning of, of the Te Reo Māori. Yep. Uh, go and ask, who, started, who, who was the politician who started the Māori Sports Awards? Who found the money for Kapahaka when nobody else did? You're yeah, sure you know this, don't you? Or the Māori Wardens? Or the Māori Women's Welfare League? Go and ask all them about the, who was the politician who done that? <laughs> but I'm sitting here amongst a whole lot of people who don't know what day it is when it comes to the performance of people. Who gave Mount Hikarangi back to Ngāti Paro? Who settled the West Coast leases? Come on. I'm going to assume it's you. <laughs> well, that's my Take point yes. here. But I'm just saying, <laughs> I've got a, a bunch of non-performing Maori and cultural fellow travellers attacking Winston Peters when their record is flimsy compared to theirs. I'm proud of our record. Mm -hmm. But I, in my country, in my party, it, we, our beliefs are in our name. It's New Zealand first, and we're all New Zealanders. Mm -hmm. A famous uh, Prime Minister asked uh, General Pornanga, the head of the military, his name is Mould, and he said to Pornanga, how many Māori have you got in the army? And Pornanga said, Prime Minister, we just have soldiers in the army. Do you get my point? Yes. Well, I hope New Zealand does too. <laughs> uh, so with, I just want to circle back quickly with another issue that you've been pretty passionate about in this so-called culture war, which is uh, the, your election promises have centred on making 
transgender, uh, with passing legislation about transgender bathrooms and not allowing transgender women or men to go into certain bathrooms. And with that, so you've announced the policy to ban transgender women from using women's bathrooms. And we just wanted to know, how do you intend to enforce this policy? Would you assign officers at every bathroom, or like public bathroom, get the IDs out? How are you intending oh, to enforce oh, such a policy? Excuse me, tell my critics to go away with their flimsy uh, <laughs> reply. How have we been enforcing males not going into female toilets now? How have we been enforcing women not going into male toilets now? This is the kind of flimsy argument when you haven't got an argument against someone. All I've said is we're going to have male, female and unisex. We're not anti-anyone. We're not anti-trans. But we're anti what happened in the case of Nicola Sturgeon, who was the leading minister in, China, in, in Scotland, and her whole career collapsed on this issue because a trans person was in a woman's facility assaulting them. You get my point? Okay. And it's happened in New Zealand. It's happened in schools where young girls were reporting, I'm not going to the toilet at all because I, I, I can't be certain I'm safe. And when women write to me, and organi women's organisations write to me in substance and numbers, I'm going to listen to them and not a whole lot of people who don't care about safety and, and, people to, and women's safety and their right to feel secure in their environment. There have it's been that reports, simple. though. There have been reports that have come out by the UCLA School of Law saying that 70% of transgender people have either been verbally or physically attacked while using the bathroom of their assigned gender at birth. Right, so what I want to ask you here is you're saying that obviously women and girls aren't feeling safe going into their own bathrooms, but there's also on the flip side of that, transgender people might not feel comfortable going into bathrooms of their assigned gender. And how do we, uh, how do we chase, get this balance? Here. Did you not hear about the third toilet? Male, female, or female, male, and unisex. How could they be caught by that UCLA magnificent piece of academic research? They can't, can they? Come on. Let's not put up false obstructions well, here. That, but that would imply forcing basically every business everywhere where there's a public toilet to have a unisex toilet, which yeah, isn't the case. Every business do have unisex toilets. Every business, I know, in most houses I know, at both genders, any, any gender, any, anybody can use a darn thing, and you're not caught there either. What you've got here is people putting up in a mountain, they're turning molehills which can be fixed up into mountains. And I'll just dispose of that one because you're going to have three types of toilet. All right? Yeah. And with Chris Hipkins and Christopher Luxon both saying that this is not an election issue, why do you, you believe that this is an election issue? Well, Quite shows, a big one. It just shows they're not listening. Yeah. They don't understand what, how critical law and order is. Uh, and uh, w when you uh, make that sort of statement, you'll learn pretty quickly in this election how out of touch you were. Because when women are writing in their thousands now, and who want a fair go in sport, mm -hmm. where somebody is born with a biological advantage in a strength contest or a speed contest is competing with somebody who hasn't got that advantage. How can that be fair? Maybe we should be financing, you know, starting up trans games or what have you. But this unfairness is a defence of women's rights and, the, and, 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 and actually common sense. So let them make that uh, um, statement. But when the dust settles on election day, guess who will be calling who? Someone's calling you. You're well, apologies be, post it won't, be, it, it won't be that song, <laughs> Gloria. I think you got your number. You know that song? I love that song. Good one. I haven't heard it. <laughs> I have to give it a listen. We'll educate you It's later. a great Don't song. <laughs> I um, think they've got the area that you're living under. Right? <laughs> so the last section I just want to quickly talk to you about with this uh, Culture Wars issue is the issue of education. So you got quite mad at Ingrid Hip... Well, not mad, but you fired back at Ingrid Hipkiss for bringing up the issue of uh, the health and physical education curriculum in high schools, covering topics such as uh, awareness around sexuality and gender diversity, the impact of social media and the availability of sexually explicit and confronting online content. And I think you claimed that there was some form of indoctrination going on. What kind of indoctrination does New Zealand First intend to prevent within our school curriculum? Precisely that. Uh, because they were talking about the science curriculum. No longer going to be about science anymore. Mm -hmm. No longer going to be about biology. It's going to be about all this uh, sexual education and gender narrative and everything else that they, these woke people want to introduce. And not about education. Do you realise that in literacy and reading, uh, this country is the worst in the whole English speaking world now? We should be number one. And the same goes for maths and everything else we're doing. We are just sliding down the list of educational performance when our future economic wealth is, will be created by excellence in these matters. And meanwhile, you've got all these woke people ramming out down people's throats without even telling parents they're teaching it. Mm -hmm. 
Now, if you can tell me that, that Ms. Uh, Ingrid Hipkiss can have her view, but I'm afraid she's out of touch with 95% of the parents, maybe 99% of the parents of this country. Mm -hmm. So I'm listening to the people who do pay the taxes, not the people who receive and get the benefits of it and the salary working for TVNZ. All right? Yes. Right, so we might move on to some Vox Pops now regarding mm. the cost of living, just because we think that we've discussed the culture wars enough for today, I think. We might no, just move a, on to that There's not a one. culture war going on here. The mass majority of people out there who pay the taxes and work and slave hard, they think one thing, and a certain group of elitists think something else. And they're not interested in a thing called democracy. Mm -hmm. They believe in the Pandora's box principle. If I can sneak this through legislation, you won't be able to change it. And our answer is yes, we will. And this election is going to be about that. Okay, fantastic. That sounds like a culture war to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Isn't no. it? You, well, we need to move on to these. Agree to disagree, pops. I guess. Well, we'll one, move one, on to one, the one, vox one, pops. one last thing: when you say a culture war, yeah, I come from a mixed culture in a sense, but I'm a New Zealand and I'm proud of it. I'm part Scots, I'm part Maori, and I'm part Scots. All right, and I'm proud of both of it, and they're both actually very tribal. The Scots are as tribal as the Maori are. That's their similarity. And boy, do they, are they gossips and do they believe in the family heritage and lineage, what have you. But the point is that I'm not going to dump down on part of my DNA uh, when it was so important to me. My mother had 11 children. They had a marvellous... We were in very poor circumstances, but sacrifice and hard work with my father's efforts meant we got a chance of a lifetime to transform our lives. I'm not going to dump down on that. I'm not going to give other people a chance to dump down on other ancestry, whether it be Chinese or Indian or whatever it is. And these are the people who declared culture war because they're race-based and we're not. Excellent. Well, we have a video to play for you today of... Um, we are Going out and asking students around the university about their cost of living, their thoughts on the issue and what they would like to see changed. Hi, my name's Lily, I'm from the Vote 2023 team and today I'm on the campus of the University of Otago asking students about... How much was your last supermarket shop? 100 bucks. $130? Mine will be like between 50 to 100 bucks, just depending on like what I need throughout that week. $200. $200. $80 is a flat, so there are four of us. $80? Yeah, about that. You know, my shop alone was 100, 130. Mm. $120, but that'll get me through two weeks. It's certainly not good because it's uh, rather expensive and the crisis of, crisis of living costs or whatever, mm. it's really bad. What do you spend the most money on as a student? Personally, probably rent, I'd say. Oh, well, university. Food and rent. And then probably food, yeah. Probably rent. Electricity and power. Mm, I'll just say eating out. <laughs> meat. Uh, yeah, groceries. Where are you trying to cut costs right now in your day-to-day -day life? Definitely food, I'd say. I just, <laughs> what are you, you're only on rations, bro. Food is so expensive. <laughs> you're like in World War II. I live on my grocery, like, where I can, just wherever I can, really. Yeah, we need some I got, rations. I've got a humble lifestyle, you know, I do yoga in the morning. Yoga? I, probably buying little treats, like, going, going out to get, like, a, a feed that costs too much, probably, and just staying at home and cooking. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to cut costs in um, the, the food I'm trying to eat, because, like, you know, everything's so expensive. Just groceries, mainly. I mean, that's, that's really... Really, the only place I can cut costs was, you know, such a tight income. I do believe that fruit and veggies should be GST free. I think it's just um, like political baiting. I've heard people kind of like clowning on it, saying that it's like, like just pennies on the dime. Honestly, I think, you know, it's really not going to make that much difference. And, you know, the supermarkets will probably absorb a lot of the, you know, savings that will come from GST free. Why should we pay 15% more for fruit and veggies? Five plus a day? Is this, or is it keeps the, five, five, keeps the doctor away, as they say. It's, just, it's such a complex, um, you know, policy. It's not as simple as just, you know, taking GST off and everyone's happy. How is the cost of living affecting you as a student? When I compare prices in Fiji, um, it's quite expensive. Uh, when compared to here, I'm like just astounded by <laughs> it's the prices. Pay 150 bucks a week in rent, and although it's not the worst in Dunedin, it is miserably cold. Uh, it's freezing. 
freezing. One of my flatmates' roof has started leaking from condensation. We got two mold inspectors in today. It's kind of, it's a bit gutting to like be paying. I guess not that much compared to other people in the country, but like enough. And especially when it's going up each year by at least ten bucks, it's a bit gutting. What did you make of that, Winston? The reality is that everything they say is correct, and it's stunning that this country, which used to have a very very affordable cost of living, and people could live. You know, they buy a house at maximum 25 of their income, uh, multiplied by three or four times would be the total price. Or if they were renting it or if they were going into a mortgage, it would still be 25% of their income. And not now like 55 and 60 and people are so hard up against it. And everything that they've said about that is about um, the failure of the political system to deliver and continue to deliver a competitive low price uh, when it comes to the cost of living, so to speak. The Labour Party promised 15 months ago a uh, groceries commissioner to be put in place 12 months ago. They only did that three, three weeks ago and it, this person is powerless. So the best thing we could do is have a full-scale investigation and surveillance with the right powers into comparative costs of our supermarkets and our banking. Because we are being ripped off. And Australia has, uh, with Australian politicians in Canberra, have had five inquiries into the Australian banking with Australian banks and those same Australian banks here have had nothing. And it's not that they're over here, that Ned Kelly's over here acting like a charity, is he? No, no, he's ripping New Zealanders off and we need to have a full-scale inquiry. And one party uniquely is in that position has argued for that, and it's been New Zealand first, we've never changed on that. And when it comes to the Groceries Commission, there are comparative costs we can aggressively go out after. Because if you've seen the latest uh, information out in the last uh, day, some of these uh, supermarkets costs have changed by 19% in the last 12 months alone. When inflation's at 6% and dipping, coming down, they've been charging 19% this year. And no one's held them to account. How will you hold them to account? We'll make sure that they're out there in front of the public facing up to, up to exposure. Sunlight is fixed as most things, you know. Even here in Dunedin. <laughs> In terms of specific policies, what, what will NZ First do to tackle this current cost of living crisis? Oh, well, we're going to ensure that there's a full-scale investigation into cost of living, uh, into supermarkets and unfair competition and also the abuse in many cases of the New Zealand grower suppliers because they're not getting the profits at all and there's a whole a sort of squeeze on and sometimes unfair practice going on and there's nothing going on in, in the political system to hold this accountable. The Chamber of Commerce, I mean, I'm sorry, the Chamber of Commerce, the Commerce Commission, what have they done? I mean, have you heard any statements from them But this is all wrong? So, you know, this business of powerless organisations put up to assure you that something's being done is just, is, just, uh, is just fake. Or the banking ombudsman, when did he come out and say the cost of banking's too high? So, again, we, we need to have a far greater performance than that, and that's in our policy. Well. It's not just groceries though, it's also housing and other costs. Do you have any uh, proposals to fix the housing crisis? That's certainly affecting students a lot as you saw in the video. Well first of all, about one third of the cost of housing is in the permission structure. This is an absolute rip-off. I was a young lawyer and used to act for countless, I used to act for nine uh, building companies uh, and, and acting for them, finding clients who buy their houses and what have you. And it was a marvellous period in time when people would come in and pay calculated maximum, four times of their annual income would be the price of the house. And then our job was to make sure that all their costs, mortgage, rate and insurance, those three charges, were no more than 25% of their disposable income. The other 75% would be able them to live. Now this is 70% of people are hard up against it at all levels. So let's go back to the resource management legislation which the National Party brought in and it's never fixed up. Make the, uh, the um, uh, consent and permission process so much quicker, so much faster and so much cheaper. And then start having a full examination of why do, why do New Zealand house price commodities cost almost 40% more than it does in Australia? Find out where the log jam of monopoly is and sort it out. We used to be the number one property owning democracy in the world. That is, more people owned a home in this country than in any other country and in terms of a population. How do we go from there to where we are now? And people can barely get by or living in degradation, uh, in circumstances of accommodation and degradation. And some of the worst would be the students down here at Otago University, from my long experience.
Mayor I've seen, been here to visit students and I just saw a rat climb through the wall. <laughs> <laughs> I, I believe it. I absolutely believe I it. it. <laughs> yep. Unbelievable. Okay, well, that was really insightful. Thank you for that. So the last topic I want to move on to today, we're just about to run out of time, but I would really love to hear your thoughts on it. So part of your 2023 election commitments is to withdraw from the United Nations Declaration of Rights for Indigenous yes. People and the subsequent He Pua Pua report mm. that was established by the Labor, Labor Caucus in 2020. So what that outlines essentially is a way that we can create co-governance in Aotearoa, New Zealand, that upholds the treaty and that honours it where we possibly can. So what that looks like... Who on earth told you that? My sources. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, the Minister of Foreign Affairs in 2007 saw that in the United Nations Declaration and said to Helen Clark, we're not signing that up. That's a challenge to our constitution and to our democracy. Straight up, we're a, dem we're a democracy and that's a challenge to what our system is and the worst victim of this will be Māori when it's all over. Right, well, that's despite, what I said then. despite your feelings towards UNDRIP, despite at the time when it was signed or brought into, uh, you know, the political sphere or now, do you not believe that it is important for our government to uphold Te Tiriti or Waitangi wherever they legally, ethically or morally can? Uh, if that is in relation to co-governance, looking at boards that have a 50-50 split as it is a partnership, do you think that it is right? For the I, don't government know to sort of, I don't know what sort of junk they're teaching down at Otago University, but I suspect it's that sort of stuff, for a start. Down here in the South Island, I'm in Ngai Tahu territory, aren't I? All the water resources here are going to be controlled by one group called Ngai Tahu. This gift of God and the diaspora and the understanding and the uh, DNA of the Pacific people, and of which Maori are one, this gift of God is also now going to become a nasty capitalist asset, so to speak. This is not Maori at all. Here's the point. Everybody down here, so from Ngāpui, Ngāti Pirō, and all the Indian, and all the Europeans, and all the Scottish people, and all the South Island, are going to get 50-50 in a decision-making process, excepting the decision-making process requires a 75% decision. Now Ngāi Tahu is in total control. That is racism. That is not the Māori world I know, or the Māori world I began, I began to defend as a young lawyer. Well, what we have been seeing is a consensus being brought together by these committees. However, we have consensus. run out of time. We have there's run no out of consensus. time. We have run out of time. Hang on, there's to no consensus. To continue this conversation, so we do have to wrap up. I am so sorry. I'm sure you are going to lay the land down for us, but we can't. Well, my point that. is that mm -hmm. this selection is about your very assertion that there is a consensus, and mm -hmm. I'm saying no, it's not. And when it's over, you'll find that someone is right, and maybe on that assumption, not yours, obviously, because you're too clever for that, you're wrong. Well, maybe we are, we'll maybe we aren't. <laughs> with one last question, given this is a student show, why should a young New Zealander vote for NZ First in 2023? Uh, because there's only one party in this country that actually stands up for a country called New Zealand, it's in our name, and we're out to create a world where young students can put it all on the line and yet have a future successfully staying here and not going overseas forever. That's our promise, and that's always been our objective. Uh, by the way, if you go and look at the education policy of other parties, we're, uh, we're the only ones that ever believed in a universal student allowance and giving people a fair break and give you, writing off your um, loans if you should go out into the provinces and stay there for five years in critical areas. We're a pro progressive party in that concept, in that context. And um, bear this in mind, you've got two votes. If your proclivity is to go out and make a mistake and vote for the other parties, fine. But on your party vote, buy yourself some insurance and party vote New Zealand first. Okay. Got it? Absolutely. That is all we have time for today. I'm Charlotte Werner. This is Jonah Broughton. We have been joined by the Right Honourable Winston Peters. Thank you for tuning in to Vote 2023.